there's a, there's a, there's a global campaign called Thinking Plant Medicine. Did you guys catch wind of that on the internet? Who heard of the Thinking Plant Medicine campaign? Cool. They're trying to get 100,000 stories shared so people can kind of uh, feel that there's not as much stigma surrounding these medicines as there used to be. So not only would you get to um, get to feel open about your own healing, but you could maybe inspire people around the world to also contemplate that path like John's giving it in his mind and also just uh, encourage other people to open up. So if you're feeling up to it, I uh, hope you can share later on with our filmer, Danny and Kim. We give them a round of applause for helping us. Salix also helped connect us with Selena of BKE Kombucha. They graciously donated some plant-based delicious drinks for us tonight. So thank you, Selena. Thank you, Salix. Good round of applause to BKE Kombucha. Uh, do you want to say anything? Or? Um, yeah, I'll say something. Okay. I was really hard to get up the subway stairs. 
was huffing and puffing, out of breath, um, muscle weakness. Like I was a college athlete, I'd had ice hockey and I could barely get up the several stairs. Um, it was like oxygen wasn't reaching my legs. And um, I tried everything in Western medicine and um, it really exhausted my options and saw different practitioners. One of whom had done ayahuasca seven times, but he said I wasn't ready for it. Um, and I actually, when I moved to Austin, I, um, I worked at Whole Foods for a while. And then they laid off our whole team. And at that point I was like, fuck it, I'm going to Peru. And, um, and I'm gonna try ayahuasca. And um, basically, um, I did it, I stayed there for three months. And um, it really, I mean, I didn't, it didn't heal me physically. Every single ceremony, and there were 50 of them, I thought I just want to heal my legs, I just want to feel better. And a lot of times the medicine doesn't necessarily give you what you want immediately, but she gives you what you need. And the things that she gave me, I mean, I re-experienced the death of my dad in a really intimate, detailed way, and I was able to re-feel it again because I hadn't expressed it prior to that. Um, I saw why, why I had been alone most of my life. I saw that I had also become a sick person and I had taken on that identity. Um, I saw that I was overdrafting some ceremonies. I'm a writer and film producer, and I saw that I was like sometimes overdrafting ceremonies to try to get the result I wanted, and that was not cool either. Um, anyway, ayahuasca transitioned to a plant called iboga, and I'll share just a little bit about that really quickly. I don't know how many of you know about it, but it's a root bark from Africa, um, and it's also the root of um, an alkaloid called ibogaine, which is the sort of synthesized drug that's known for helping with opioid addiction. It is like, boom, one of, it's not a cure-all, but more effective than any other treatment out there. And it really gets to the heart of the issue. And I'd always heard about iboga in terms of ibogaine because it was just like, I thought, oh, that's what it's for. Um, and I don't have that, I don't have opioid addiction. So I forgot about it five years later and then about a year and a half ago, after doing so much ayahuasca, which in many ways healed me profoundly, you know, it didn't address the physicality of the situation. Um, and again, I had been diagnosed with Lyme disease, thyroid, you know, all these things, and I didn't know what was what, and I thought maybe this is just my fucking mind. Like, you know, how do I know what's me and myself and my body and what's a pathogen? So um, I went to Costa Rica and I did a boga. And um, overnight, it healed me. <laughs> and um, I would say the first thing it, that it offered me was, it had told me with such clarity, kind of just like a slap in the face, like a knowingness, you know, she was talking about intellectually knowing something, but this was like knowing it with all your body. A, that I talked trash to myself my entire life. Like, I was just, my self-worth was so low that I would never speak that way to a stranger. I would never speak that way to my good friend, and yet I was speaking that way to myself. And it was just like, you know, it was just such knowingness. So that was profound. It's a very visual medicine, not for everyone, but it shows you, you know, like a film strip of your life, all these events that come up. Um, but the biggest thing is, you know, overnight I burped like a Game of Thrones dragon for five <laughs> hours straight. I vomited so much. And um, the next morning I could breathe again normally in my legs were like strong and supple, like I was when I was 13 or 18 or whatever, and I couldn't believe it. I was just so shocked. Um, and, you know, for people who have different things, I know we all have this thing in our life that we don't have anymore that we take for granted, but breath is like that thing where you, you know it until you don't have it anymore, and it doesn't feel the same. So, um, anyway, I was so excited, but what I will say is my symptoms came back. Within about five days, they came back. And um, I was living, I moved to Nicaragua at the time to live in a community. And I was there and I thought, immediately after I did a book the first time, I thought, I'm gonna go to Africa and learn more about this plant. And um, the group where I was, they were planning a trip around Christmas. And so I, um, I decided I wanted to go to Costa Rica one more time to try it, um, to see like if, you know, I was just very scared to go to Africa. I wanted to go, my God told me, but I just wanted to try this again. So I went to Costa Rica again, and the same thing happened, boom, healed overnight, burping, belching, like 
like expelling all this trapped air in the legs. All of a sudden, I could feel oxygen reaching my legs. And um, but again, five days later, the symptoms came back. Um, so I went to Africa and to be initiated into the Masoko tradition tribe. And uh, I won't go into all of it, but Aboga is used by um, the Bubi culture in Gabon and Cameroon to study life. They use it for psycho spiritual elements, but they use it to heal elements. They use it to come together as a community. The pygmies were using it thousands of years before this. This is a medicine that is part of their life and their society and their culture. Um, so, again, the same thing happened in. Uh, in Gabon, and um, you know, very witnessed very powerful healing there of friends and um, all that. And I firmly, Boga is still in me, it's still in my whole being. The lessons that have taught me are amazing. Um, and it's not just about the physical, like for me, it's shown me that it's given me that taste of what it's like to heal, what it's like to feel physically at least normal again. And um, yeah. I mean, I, I think I'm a writer and a filmmaker, and I we always search for these beginning, middle, and ends, and this perfect story that's wrapped in a bow. And it's not always like that, but for me, like I know that I'm moving towards the ending, you know, or, or even just being like and accepting where I am and where I'm going. So, thank you. I was going to ask, did you find a way to extend the healing effects of it beyond five days? <laughs> Sure. Um, I'm not an expert, so I don't really know, but I'm not. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I just met a woman last night who's very close to the head of palliative care at Columbia. And I'm not, and she just spoke in very general terms that this person was 
so frustrated this was not available yet okay. because they know, you know. Obviously, Mass is doing studies on iodine, MDMA, and psilocybin are the closest. Something will happen. You know, in Denver, there's so much encouragement around growing your own mushrooms because it's now decriminalized for personal use, for cultivation, for um, possession in Denver County. And so the hope is it's, it's not just going to be a medical thing, which that could be a good thing for plenty of people, but it also can be encourage people to heal themselves by growing their own mushrooms, and that's happening in Denver. I know it's happening here too. You know, it's happening everywhere, but um, to help reduce the stigma and have people literally do it. I mean, like in Denver, we had meetings with the um, ambulance, like emergency medical, you know, technicians. Is that true? No. How do you say? Anyway. Uh, the MT, I don't know if I said they're correct. Um, they didn't know the difference between PCP and psilocybin. So it's going to take some time to, to uh, educate everyone. And, um, but I think we're close, but obviously there's a lot of way to go. Sure. So. Can we give another round of applause to Caitlin? <laughs> Um, we do have one more featured speaker. Um, I'd like, I'd feel amiss if I didn't give a little shout out to plant medicine. So do you mind if I share a story with guys? Is that cool? Yeah. No. No. <laughs> next speaker is, <laughs> um, I have dabbled with ayahuasca a few times in Queens. Went to the concrete, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> concrete jungle. Um, so I think there's this Peru and upstate that Salix mentioned, but um, that was intense. I gotta say, something about hearing Daddy Yankee in combination with Icaros <laughs> brought a lot out. <laughs> um, but I was actually going to share a little story about mushrooms that's kind of simple, but I'd like to share. I took psilocybin mushrooms. I ate them uh, in Brooklyn, where they're not legal. And uh, um, I ate them with a friend of mine, another friend of mine, who one was kind of experienced like Alex, the other one was her first time, it was also her birthday. But I, we put on the Johns Hopkins playlist, and you know what, I'm gonna try to do this just as the doctor ordered. <laughs> I'm gonna use up, you know, the seven gigabytes necessary to download this six hour playlist they kindly provided for us. It's really good. Has anyone else tripped at the Johns Hopkins? Paul Horn. Paul Horn. Oh, it's not Paul Horn. It's Hopkins. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it is intense. There's some really good Dosage. Dosage? Dosage. Oh, it was just 3.58. It was, it was an eighth, but um, before I got them, the person's like, all right, you want Amazonian, Chilean, Kenyan, or Hawaiian? And I did not know the difference, but they were pretty strong. Um, so it was an eighth, but it definitely hit me like, you know, pretty hard. And I didn't, I didn't, I fasted also. Um, but anyways, and I also mixed some lemon in with the tea that I made. Um, I did, I did do, I drank caramelin once with mushrooms, but I guess they were too wet or something, not dry enough, so to do like a psilocybin <laughs> coughed. I was doing that. <laughs> oh! <laughs> um, you work with Bucha. Um, anywho, Fasted was our first time, had the Johns Hopkins playlist going, really beautiful, some good vocals and opera in there. Um, and really simply, this is a benefit of plant medicines that I would probably share to someone who wasn't as cool as us here in Brooklyn, but you know, just maybe a little intimidated by plant medicines, but my grandma passed away in 2018, December 2018. I was very close with her, and she left me some money, not a ton, but like enough to get through like a summer with, with, with pretending to work. So that was like very cool. I got to like just kind of do my thing without having to worry about money too much for a little bit. And, sorry, you guys live here. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> <family> here. <laughs> um, and I was like really grateful to have that when I was on this mushroom, the money from my grandma was on this mushroom experience. I was kind of, I really felt like I was kind of interfacing with an intelligence. And I'm someone who, previously could have been described as like, you know, hardcore 
materialist or something, and even though I've been organizing in psychedelic spaces, I've never really had a visceral experience of kind of engaging with an intelligence. But this time, it really did feel like something was kind of guiding me, and somehow the switch happened where it's like, hey man, you didn't say this, and it was like, hey dude. But basically I felt like, hey bro, uh, on a very visceral level, but kind of just like give gratitude to my grandma for helping me pay the bills. And it was like really simple kind of thing, it was like, I, you know, like, but I didn't really just connect with how many people I have like kind of supporting me, just like with friends and my network, and it felt like a profound amount of gratitude and the need to express that. So I like went upstairs and like prayed and thanked and like sprayed my grandma and everything. It was a very profoundly moving experience. And I truly I can say I think the mushrooms kinda like taught me like, hey man, just show some gratitude in this case. And it just really like helped get things a lot of things moving. So thank you, Plant Medicine. Thank you, mushrooms. And grandma. So thank you. Um, but I'd like to introduce our final featured speaker. Um, then we're going to have a little break and then do some open mic sharing if you guys would feel called to do that. But can we all please welcome my good friend Kavon Simpson to the microphone? Welcome, Kavon. We just took in a lot of information. Can everyone stretch your Oscar. Even when it's good stuff. And take a deep breath in, all the way in, all the way in, all the way in. And close it off. It's cool. It's off. And really take in our co creation of finding out, finding out about this plant medicine. The, the embodiment of it. Take a moment in your body to move beyond all surface layers and lift all of the bodies in the room until you see each person's soul light shining into the space into each other. Because this is, this is what is needed for the road ahead. And if we can't do that and we get caught up in the surface things, we are we are doomed. So open your eyes. I want to share this excerpt from the Diamond Sutra. How can one explain the sutra to others without holding in mind any arbitrary conception of forms or phenomena or spiritual truths? It can be done by keeping the mind in perfect tranquility and free from any attachment to appearances. So I say to you, this is how to contemplate our conditioned existence in this fleeting world, like a tiny drop of dew or a bubble floating in a stream like a flash of lightning in a cold summer, or a flickering lamp, an illusion, a phantom, or a dream. So is all conditioned existence to be seen. Contemplate them thus. Words of the Buddha, Diamond Sutra. So, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, not bed side per se, but back when I was growing up in Brooklyn, you couldn't really come to this part of town, it was fucking dangerous as shit. Um, <laughs> But I'm from Crown Heights. I grew up in Crown Heights. I grew up in this flat, which was the first uh, generation to make an immigrant. Sometimes we talk like so. Let me talk to you. Keep on us on what I say. But if I talk that way a long time, you don't know what I'm saying. So I code switch to, to, to be uh, as communicative as possible. Brooklyn has changed a lot. Enough for me to wear my hippie clothing and not get harassed. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm like what, yeah, in between how I feel about things, so to speak. So that's why I say to live the body. And see the souls and the spirits. And, and to know that the conversation of honoring the original inhabitants of the land and the neighborhood is part of the conversation we can hold. And that we can't get uncomfortable about it. And all that. And if, if we get uncomfortable about it, then, then we get shrunk again. And, and we're still in the planet. Because we're afraid to speak. And the planet, no arguments. I hate you. existence in this fleeting world, like a tiny drop of dew, or a bubble floating in a stream, 
like a flash of lightning in a cold summer, or a flickering lamp, an illusion, a phantom, or a dream. So is all conditioned existence to be seen. Alchemy, contemplate to them, open the space of hope. Water to the Buddha, and I will teach you a made of Water. A drop of water becomes the ocean without losing essence. But from crown height, it from crown height, and feel as the from first to last generation to make an imprint. Sometimes we talk like so. When we talk, people keep on understand what I say. But if I talk a really long time, you don't know what I'm saying. So I code switch to, to be uh, as communicative as possible. Brooklyn has changed a lot. Enough for me to wear my hippie hologram and not get the one wraps. So I'm like, I'm like what? in between how I feel about things, so to speak. So that's why I say to the thoughts and plants and the souls and the past. And to know that the conversation of honoring the original inhabitants of the land and the neighborhood is part of the conversation moving forward. And that we can't get uncomfortable about it. And if, if we get uncomfortable about it, then, then we get shown again. And, and it's going to be fine. A drop of water becomes the ocean without losing essence of its shape. Though you may feel as tiny as a molecule of hydrogen, don't forget that you make floating possible. Carry your life like a wave and let it drip through the hardest hearts of stone. Water falls without resistance, flow, fire. And if you must burn, burn everything. Leave nothing of the old, fearful self afraid to speak alive. Come alive and flicker like passion out of control and learn what love is firsthand. Warm a hand after helping it. Level the forest of negative thought. Plant new trees in ash. They will grow because of you, because of you, earth. Stand there and wait with patience and humility. You will intimately know the footprints of a baby's first steps. Dig up history with the shovel of your bones and build a mountain of purpose stronger than your pain. Climb and climb and no matter what they tell you, don't ever look down because that's not where the clouds go. Dream, move silently, air. Don't announce your name or wait for it to be called. But fill everything with your presence. They need you more than they know. Hide under a bird's wing and sing only when called to the window of your soul. Look in and win with the wind, ether. The space between each element and even the highest vibration of thought. Didn't your dream come true? And wasn't it unseen before it came to you? Artists of old have said this is where angels of good luck come from, playing their angelic harps and ancestral drums, the unseen rhythm you still walk to, the song yet to be written and the note yet to be sung, and whatever it is that makes your heart beat quiet enough to forget that it's even happening until right now. <laughs> So before ayahuasca, I was not playing any damn thing, or singing, or able to look at you all. I want to share a song called Blessing Angels from the Sacred Valley Tribe. Uh, help me out, Brother Antonio. What's, the, what's, what's, what's this brother's name? The Sacred Valley Tribe. Diego Palma. Diego Palma. Diego Palma is where I learned this song. I have some friends here, I'm very happy to see your face. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Christy, Salix, Caitlin, and Kavan. We'll give one more round of applause to our future speakers. <laughs> just to get a pulse of the room, who's interested in like sharing to just like the crowd? Anybody? A few people. Shy. People are shy. Um, all right. Why don't we? Would you? What's your name? Kendra. We have a warm welcome to Kendra, please. And the teacher speakers are welcome to sit down if they play. Hey family, uh, my name is Kendra. 
Um, I have been working with plant medicine specifically, or mostly ayahuasca, for the last three years of my life. Um, as a matter of fact, February is my three year mark. Um, I came to ayahuasca, well actually that's not true, ayahuasca came to me. You know, ayahuasca came into my awareness. Um, I didn't even know it by name, um, but I started seeing documentaries and you know, spirit molecule and I was like, interested and a little like, eh, well, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I'll do that. I can't go to Peru, I, so you, know, you don't know what you don't know, right? Grandmother, who I refer to um, as ayahuasca, came to me and through a friend, um, and she said, do you know what ayahuasca is? And I said, well, I don't know, sounds familiar, but let's talk about it. So long story short, we talked about it, and she said, well, what if I told you I could get you an invitation to an underground group that's right here in New York? And I was like, oh, sign me up. And so I went through the process to be invited to this underground group, uh, which is actually where I met uh, Kevon. And um, I sat with the medicine. And I, it's interesting, it's so funny for me because going into I, um, my profession, uh, at this point in my life, I'm a yoga teacher, I, I teach mindfulness, I teach you know connectivity to the self. And so I walked into that room sort of feeling like, yeah, I, I know what I know, right? Like, I'm connected to the universe. Um, and then I found myself clinging to the edge of like, ah! you know, like what is happening, you know, um, faced with a lot of decisions about whether or not I was actually going to heal this trauma that I was carrying around in my body. Um, and what the medicine showed me that first experience was that although I would have articulated that um, I did a lot of deep healing, the medicine was like, but let me show you that you're not really doing that. Uh, let me show you how surface level you're staying and how safe it is that you're playing um, with your healing uh, rituals. And um, I, very interestingly, um, you know, part of the ayahuasca experience can be a purge, a physical purge. Um, my purge didn't come that night until I shared that realization that, wow, I've been really playing it safe uh, with this healing that I thought I was doing. And so I was the last person to purge. Like, people were rolling up their mats to go home. And I was like, oh my god, you know? And um, <laughs> it was hilarious, actually. It was really fortunate that the woman next to me saw the state I was in because it was her bucket that she threw under me so that I didn't throw up on my clothes. <laughs> um, so from that point, I've been um, working with uh, ayahuasca medicine. Um, I'm actually preparing for another ceremony um, this weekend. So i um, really excited for that. Um, one of the speakers, and I apologize, I don't remember who it was, but um, talked about the plant medicine being um, a being, not just a plant, like a sentient being that you can have a relationship with. And I'm just going to share a short story about that. Um, I traveled to California to journey with a shaman that I work with um, that I love very much. And in that journey, um, the first night I was assisting, and we hadn't even taken any medicine at that point, and I began to purge. I began to purge more than I think I'd ever purged before in any ceremony. And in my head, I kept saying, I don't understand what's happening right now because I haven't even taken any medicine. And the grandmother, who um, to me is very like a, like a it can be a trickster or, or, you know, has a good sense of humor, I'll say that, um, said to me, oh, silly girl, you, think you, you still think you have to ingest me. I'm already in you and there's work to do, so you're just going to have to go with this. And I did, I purged, I didn't assist anyone that night, I just purged and purged and purged. Um, I had a lot of pain in my solar plexus uh, that night. And I had a healer tell me the next day as I was preparing to sit in my own journey that my solar plexus the night before had been replaced with a new, deeper, energetic, um, a, a more expansiveness. And so I went into that second ceremony um, and I started off with a medium dose because I thought I was gonna, con again, I was gonna control my experience. And uh, that was the first time that I ever experienced ego death on a medium dose. 
of medicine, and I like nobody was more surprised than me. Um, nobody was more surprised than me. I was like, wow, my my plan did not work. You know, I was going to go really surface level. I was back in that place of fear. Um, the most profound experience for me that night was in that ceremony. I met the grandmother. You know, she came to me as a sentient being, and we had a conversation, and we talked, and we literally danced, and it was beautiful. And the next morning, I woke up. Um, for me, um, this was a very validating experience because there was a woman in that ceremony who had traveled from China to be in that ceremony with us, and that's only relevant because she didn't speak any English at all. And she had a translator with her, and I was one of the first few people up in the morning, and they were talking. And as I approached them, it was clear that she was trying to get his attention to tell me something. And so he asked permission. She said, she wants to tell you something. Can I share it? I said, of course. And uh, she said to him to say to me that when I had my conversation with the grandmother, and when we embraced, when grandmother and I, ayahuasca and I embraced and we danced, that it was the most beautiful thing that she'd ever seen. And she was grateful for me to share energetically that experience with her. And he said, does that make sense? And the tears that were falling off my face in that moment told him that, yeah, it did make sense. Because for me, although, I knew what I knew, I knew that I had that experience, but to have another human being be able to articulate exactly what I went through with no reason to know it other than we were sharing sacred space and we were healing in this collective was profound and beautiful. And I've been working with that medicine ever since. Um, I got introduced uh, to psilocybin mushroom medicine through Sensei Kevan, um, and that has opened up even more avenues for me, and what I can say, um, you know, thank you to the plant medicine, it has changed my life. The traumas that I have been able to release um, were ones that I had resigned myself to living with forever and ever and ever. Um, so yeah, that's what I'll say. Um, thank you, plant medicine. Thank you, Kevan. Uh, thank you, family. Thank you, my love. And I love you all. Let's give a warm welcome to Delano. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm a uh, uh, recurring Brooklyn, Brooklyn Psychedelic Society member, and it's so great to see new faces every time I come to new events. And uh, it's great to be here with y'all. Um, I. Uh, come from a background of uh, being an artist, being a filmmaker, being very curious about my reality, and psychedelics have allowed me to <coughs> unveil reality and allowed to see that there's another side that you're, not, that you're not in touch with because we block it. And in our, in our normal day-to-day -day lives, we're, we're so used to what we're doing that we don't we don't think about these different uh, um, uh, peculiarities of reality. So we, when I uh, first took mushrooms in the Everglades when I was 16 years old, I felt like I had connected with God. I felt like I connected with the creator, something definitely more significant than just this scientific material reality. And uh, I've taken mushrooms many, many times just to get in touch with my deep personal issues. And while I was exploring psychedelics and smoking cannabis and opening up myself to uh, new ideas, I uh, was also very much into uh, uh, Zen Buddhism and the uh, British philosopher Alan Watts, who allowed me to see that reality is kind of just merely an illusion. So when I applied a lot of these concepts to my psychedelic experiences, I started getting into transcendental meditation and just trying to be in that moment 
and not try to expect anything or want anything or, you know, just feel like feeling like you always have to be doing something was when I started to do nothing and just be in that moment on shrooms, LSD, DMT, whatever it might be, I felt like, you know, being in this moment, doing nothing is exactly what I need to be doing. So laying down, um, I guess, is what you would call transcendental meditation. And, uh, I've really enjoyed that part of uh, my trips and uh, being more uh, uh, calm uh, and having a, a feeling like, you know, sometimes you just got to stop taking everything so seriously and, and just be happy. I think sometimes the, the best, best uh, benefit of these plant medicines is learning how to be happy, to go with the flow. Um, and uh, in the words of George Carlin, one of my favorite comedians, it's important not to give a fuck. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm glad that it's so nice to connect with people that uh, want to explore this on so many different levels. And um, if uh, you ever want to learn about how to experience transcendental meditation on psychedelics, um, I'd love to talk with you more about it. Uh, but that's, that's my story. And uh, uh, really great seeing you. Want to give a quick shout out? Um, has anyone here heard of Decriminalized Nature NYC? Yeah. yeah. They are a small group of people who are focused on helping us also decriminalize the psychedelic plant medicines here in New York. And a representative from their group, Anthony, is in the building. Is that gentleman? We give a welcome to Anthony for joining us. If you're interested in learning more about Decrim NYC, definitely hit up Anthony. He'll be hanging out with us for a little bit. And yeah, it's an exciting initiative. And BPS is help, happy to try to help them in any way we can. Uh, we'd like to welcome Ram to the mic, please. We have a warm welcome to Ram and others. Uh, I'll keep this brief. Uh, I don't like to take credit for anything. I feel like. So I'll keep it. Uh, last week I went to Amsterdam and I took truffles a couple days, uh, a couple different ceremonies. If anybody's ever been to Amsterdam, it's decriminalized. Uh, they have a couple places where you can sort of just lounge out in the back and take your truffles there, 10 grams, and have a great time. Um, I did it around a couple Scottish tourists and I always take in psychedelics by myself. But being around other people, being around like tourists, being around people that are very eager and very happy, a lot of emotions coming by. And I just being around others, I, I got to notice that a lot of people project their emotions, a lot of people are putting their energy out there and it's you don't notice but it's flying around all the time. And sort of I also meditate and just grounding myself and just realizing that like in the moment you can sort of be translucent and empty and just feel everything in that moment. feels really good. And uh, yeah, I had a great time. I suggest you all try psilocybin and troubles, which I think they're the same. But yeah, I just want to say I love psychedelics and thank you, Plant Medicine. <laughs> What's your name? You want to share? What's your name? AJ. AJ? Can we give a more welcome to AJ? <laughs> Let's keep it going. He's going around. Let's just keep the clapping going. Hey guys. So I would like to share uh, two experiences I had with the uh, psychedelic. One with LSD and another with mushroom. Um, I had a lot of trauma. Uh, when in India, I was in a controlled environment where you're not supposed to share emotions. Uh, you cannot be gay, or bisexual. Uh, it just got legalized two years back. So I had all these issues, uh, and I could not share it to anyone. 
uh, when I reached the United States, um, I saw that it's not that bad. I can talk about it and I can actually be curious about it. So one experience I had with LSD is um, I have a therapist also, so he made me realize that I'm blocking a uh, sexual experience. And uh, how I'm blocking, this is something I have to figure out. And I did, I, I was tripping on LSD, I focused on it, and I felt like uh, whenever I'm about to have a good sexual experience, I'm holding it, I'm, uh, I'm kind of very t uh, holding it very tight in my body, so I don't feel it completely. And with LSD, I just had to let it go. Now, because with, with LSD, I was able to cross that experience and reach to other side which I never experienced before. And uh, so after that, uh, after that, it became very easy for me. I was able to experience it without drugs. Uh, so that is one experience. And uh, not only that, uh, on the same trip, I actually realized that I am not able to live my life uh, freely. I was not able to uh, breathe. Uh, I felt in my heart that uh, that I'm controlling my heart to uh, beat, like it's not able to beat freely. Uh, so that was another experience. All, all the things which I was holding my, in my body, my shoulder used to be like this. I used to just hold everything tight. Now I feel like it's just so relaxed and I can let go of anything. And I don't need to be scared to experience anything. talk about this uh, mushroom. Um, so I had, uh, I, when I was a kid, uh, I had to, my dad was like moving with jobs, so every year or so I had to go to new school and uh, I had very difficult time connecting with others. Whenever I reached to a new school, uh, they would just not let me come to their room. So I had to stand on the side. Um, so I develop this uh, behavior. Whenever I see a group, I actually cannot stand in the group, and I just go backwards, just so I can be distant to the group. I didn't want to be part of the group. I could not realize that I was doing this intentionally, and everyone else would see that I just don't like that. But it was my fear. Um, and with Mushroom, I, I was talking to my wife, who actually helped me understand that this is this is something I need. I needed a help. I needed someone to pull me back in the group. And uh, I was able to admit it that it was my fear. Before that, I was not even able to admit it. I would rather just leave that place. Uh, and yeah, so that was the second experience. Thank you guys. We've got time for one more brave person to share. What's your name? Samantha. Samantha, we warm welcome to Samantha. I would hear this voice, 
And this voice was very comforting and very kind and very warm and felt like from inside me. And was telling me everything was going to be okay. And I remember seeing, um, you know, I'm in therapy and I, I, I have this, uh, in therapy, you, they say to you, to label your inner critic. Mine's called the shadow rat. Uh, and I remember seeing the shadow rat. I remember seeing a bunch of stairs and this rat who looked like a cartoon version of Templeton from um, Charlotte's Web. Uh, and he just was running around these stairs and he was like in, he's like a very business suit. He almost kind of was like Woody allen -y. I don't know. And he was just like, I'm not such a bad guy when you get to know me. I'm not such a bad, bad guy when you get to know me. I'm not such a bad guy when you get to know me. And what I was seeing is how that inner critic was protecting me all along. Um, and I was able to talk to it. Um, and I got kind of really, uh, I have an addictive personality by, I, I believe more is more. I'm um, that type of person. And um, I started doing more and more. And um, you know, once, uh, you know, the, the, the spirit guide, I guess the, the wonderful lady, she came to me and she said, you know, this is the last time Samantha. You know, you need to go to Brew. You need to, um, I'm actually interested in all your guys, where you guys have gone. Please talk to me afterwards. Um, but you have to go to Peru and do it. And I disobeyed her. And I did it one more time. And all I remember is uh, everything turned black. And I just heard this dark voice saying, I told you not to do this anymore. Go to Peru. <laughs> So then I listened. So um, those are my experiences, and I'm super, super excited and feel blessed to explore this more. Thank you. Let's welcome Elise to the stage. This is a really old story that's bubbling up. Um, it happened in 1995. Uh, I went to the very first ish Burning Man and took somebody's dose, which was for a 220 pound man, um, and proceeded to have visions for about 20 hours. I was beating my heart with my hand, tears coming down my face. I had my head on an ice block, and it just rained on me only. Like I was hot and it just rained only on me. So I had like a really crazy mystical experience. Apart from that, when I came out, there was rainbows, triple rainbows, giant mushroom crab, literally, you'll see pictures if you ever look it up. <laughs> um, my intention was to help my sister who was passing. She was 28 and she had breast cancer. So I was asking for strength to help her pass. And I knew I had to be her guide. And um, I got this huge download of all my DNA female ancestors that were within me. And I kind of became a shaman for her for about three months to help her pass, earn her medicines, go in the cold ocean so that her body could feel me with her. She passed when I was in the Pacific Ocean, telling her I felt her. So that experience is sort of disparate from my life. And it's been very hard to integrate all the visions I saw in that state, all the amazing patterns. I did actually was a painter at the time, a filmmaker, and I saw the work of Alex Gray, who is, I have to say, if you ever want to see a combination of body, of visceralness, spirit, and cosmos together to check out his work. It's up in upstate New York. I actually went there. They have full moon ceremonies every month. I went two weeks ago. It's an amazing place to just look at paintings and be among like-minded people. So I wanted to tell you all about that as a resource. And I think it might be useful to have some kind of integration from that experience back into, uh, I'll just call it our mundane world, where we can be our inner shaman somehow. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, you guys ready to meet each other? Yeah. Um, I'll just share a super quick 
I a story. I did ayahuasca the first time in September, right before my 29th birthday. And the first night was like really good. Again, I was in the concrete jungle of Queens, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and it was really easy to handle the first night. I was like sitting up the whole time, and I was like, wow, this is like really great. Uh, I, can do, I can do more of this. And so the next day I asked for Mas Fuerte when I went up to drink uh, Mas Fuerte over more grossiness. And it was the most harrowing experience of my life. Uh, all right, so <laughs> um, in a nutshell, it just felt like I was, I have had issues with psychedelics in the past where I've gone a little too off the deep end with the uh, seeming veracity of the ideas in my head and real life and decided to snip the usual bright line in between those to where I was just kind of, uh, you know, wasn't sleeping much and just had a lot of, maybe people can relate, it was close to mania, maybe it was mania, it was mania. And, uh, <laughs> So I was kind of worried about that cause. I had a lot of insights then, but also caused a lot of family and friends a lot of stress. So I was kind of worried about that happening again and doing this ayahuasca again. But after the first night, I was like, this is amazing. Uh, definitely could do higher strength. I can't believe I did ayahuasca and it was that easy. Um, that was arrogance that was talking. <laughs> Because the next night was, like I said, heroin, and basically I thought like I completely had lost my mind, um, like completely, like in the marrow of my bones, thought I had gone like Titanic sinking bonkers with everything. And I saw all these moments leading up to that point where I decided to take ayahuasca, and friends of mine were like, I don't know, I don't think that's a good idea. And I was replaying in my head like, I don't think that was a good idea. And I was like, damn. <laughs> damn was she right <laughs> and just all these kind of kind of red flags too with the the session that happened and stuff that I, I don't think were actually red flags of the session perhaps but at the time I was superimposing those onto the experience eventually I came down and I realized I wasn't permanently broken but felt like I had experienced that and it took me a while to realize but I think the kind of ayahuasca showed me or had me like live through one of my worst fears and then kind of took me out of that. I was like, I get the grandma thing now. <laughs> it kind of like a strict, stern experience that I had. And um, for me personally, with BPS is like, part of our mission is to make these things, these plant medicines like uh, communicable to people who, you know, might not be as familiar with them. And just the fact that there's these substances that can help you actually like then take you through your worst fears and actually like live through that like what kind of people are we capable of becoming if that's something that we can experience in the safe environment I'm not, it's not easy it's not something that most people would sign up for but the fact that that and many other categories of very beneficial experience can be had almost on tap is like like gives me a lot of optimism for you know where we can go with our society so Anyways, thank you all for listening to my little story and uh, for coming to me. Thank you guys so much. We're not over yet. We have a donation box <laughs> um, that if you... First of all, we have one more round of applause for all the open mind people who... Yeah, thank you guys for coming. I uh, really appreciate being here and hope to see you at more Brooklyn Psychedelic Society events. So. Thank you guys.